range group. Um, we will be uh, recording uh, this meeting for future record. Um, you may have gotten that notice. Um, and I'm, I'm joined tonight by a few of my colleagues also in long range planning, uh, John Anagnost, Matthew Clem, and Bina Malter. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we're going to start with a brief presentation kind of about the request um, and then move on to uh, question and answers. Um, as, as I mentioned, John, John and I are leading this project. Um, here's our contact information. You're always welcome to reach out. Um, I will show this information again at the end um, of the presentation so you have it. Um, but as I mentioned, we're going to start with a quick presentation about um, what the request is, what the intent of the request, rezoning request is, um, what you can expect for the process moving forward. Um, and opportunities to participate and share your, your thoughts. Um, and then we wanna have the majority of the time for your questions um, and answering uh, any of the questions we can. Um, so, so you know what to expect. You're welcome to you know, put your questions uh, in the chat during the presentation. Uh, we're gonna start with the questions we received there. Um, really looking mainly at the, um, questions on about the rezoning request. Um, and then we'll turn towards um, if we have any folks joining us by phone, may unmute those um, joining by phone to make sure um, they have a chance to share any comments. And then we'll turn uh, if, if people have questions they want to ask um, in the meeting, um, they can raise your, can raise your hand and we'll um, address those, those questions next. So um, to discuss this request, I'm gonna take a step back and talk about um, bus rapid transit, which you may be aware is a new um, type of bus service that's coming to Raleigh and Wake County. Um, some, some around five or six years ago, the Wake Transit Plan was adopted. Um, voters approved um, plan to fund creating a bus rapid transit system. Um, on this slide here, here's uh, some information about what makes bus rapid transit or BRT different from standard bus service. Um, essentially, it has its own dedicated lane, so it's not competing with car traffic to get up, um, down its routes. And there are stations instead of stops. Um, so pay for your fare uh, off uh, to get onto the station, and then there's a, um, uh, Boarding is a little quicker um, on the station. Um, and so we have this new transportation infrastructure coming to um, Raleigh. And um, Raleigh is, the city has also been thinking about how do we uh, have our land use planning uh, react and interact with that new infrastructure. So you may have been familiar with this project, the equitable development around transit project in the last couple of years. Um, this is a, a project that really asked, um, given that we have this new major infrastructure coming, we know that Raleigh is growing. Um, how do we want to grow um, in the future? Uh, continue to grow around driving um, and car ownership or to uh, grow more around transit and more around a walkable um, type of built form. So out of this project, um, there are a number of, of uh, ways to achieve that, um, or I should say rather, this was a public process um, that resulted in um, you know, community consensus, consensus that um, the city wants to grow more around transit. And, and um, out of that project came a few tools to achieve that. Uh, one of them is to use Raleigh's zoning um, code, so the Unified Development Ordinance to achieve that. Um, and um, so the, the city has um, created um, this new updated transit overlay district. Um, so overlay district uh, is a zoning district, a type that um, is sort of second layer that's applied um, over the underlying zoning. So every, every property 
property in the city has an underlying zoning and some properties have another layer, an overlay district um, that, that uh, works with the underlying zoning um, to control development. So um, what is the goal of the, the TOD or the transit overlay district? Um, <clears throat> the goal is really to um, help uh, discourage um, more dispersed and car ori oriented development, um, encourage uh, walkable uh, urban form and a variety of uses around this transit service so that people can really use it um, in their day-to-day -day lives um, uh, and encourage in that vein, new jobs and affordable housing to locate near um, this transit service. Um, so those are the goals. Um, here are a few images of kind of what a transit oriented type of development might look like. Um, so for example, on the left, we have um, uh, that we want to move away from a more um, suburban dispersed um, car oriented form and um, more towards uh, transit oriented um, uh, distribution of uses, so a greater density around transit stops um, that then transitions into the surrounding area. Um, transit oriented development also has like a mix of uses um, that supports a much more active ground floor and street life. Um, so it's not an office park that is dead after five, for example, there's sort of continued life um, on, on that ground street level that helps make it more. Um, and then um, transit oriented development is easy to get to from a variety of modes. Um, it's not the image in the top left, um, really geared towards arriving by car um, and you have to walk uh, quite a ways through a parking lot if you're um, arriving on the sidewalk, for example. And then finally, um, the TOD has uh, some active public plazas, um, places for uh, a variety of modes um, to uh, get there and um, use, use the variety of uses that are there. Um, so those are the some big goals of TOD. I wanna talk a little bit about um, how the overlay district achieves that. Um, it, um, regulates development um, in a variety of ways. I'm gonna touch on a few topics that I think are probably some of the um, biggest changes or, or I think are likely to be, um, there might be questions about. Um, and so the first is um, prohibited uses. So every zoning district um, in Raleigh um, permits or prohibits certain uses, controls the uses that are permitted. Um, and uh, the TOD overlay has a list of prohibited uses where if the underlying zoning does permit it, um, but there is a, a TOD overlay, those would not be allowed. Um, and so these are focused on car oriented um, uses. So things like car washes, um, car sales, gas stations, um, new, wanted to discourage new uh, uses like that from locating um, in areas near transit service where people really are gonna be um, using the transit. Um, and then relatedly is some, uh, lower density housing that is really very more car oriented. So that's why you see single family duplex or single unit to unit living is another example of that new, new examples of these would be prohibited in the TOD overlay. Um, see an asterisk there about uh, maybe you were both damaged. I'm gonna talk about that in more detail. Um, but just did want to mention that the intent of, of this section is to um, uh, prohibit new, it really pertains to new um, development of this type um, rather than existing, existing uses that might be in a TD area. So um, talked about uses. The other thing that uh, the zoning code regulates is um, dimensional aspects of a building. So things like height, where it is on the property, um, how close to, to the property boundaries it is. Um, and the TOD does have some standards that relate to that. Um, 
First I'll mention is a minimum uh, building height for new, for new structures of two stories. Um, and then the second uh, pertains to uh, residential zoning districts. So areas where the underlying zoning is a residential district and a TOD, the TOD is mapped on top of that. Um, residential development in those cases um, would look to the residential mixed use uh, district to um, determine things like setbacks um, and uh, other dimensional standards, lot size on um, in those cases. And then the last one is there is a requirement um, currently for a transition between mixed use districts and residential districts. And um, the TOD would, in certain circumstances, allow a, a sort of smaller transition. Um, and then the last topic, um, as I alluded to, is what happens when um, a use, an existing use or an existing structure doesn't comply with the, the TOD standards, um, but it's in a TOD district. Um, this is what we call uh, non-conforming structure or non-conforming use. Um, and um, non-conforming structures uh, can be rebuilt, maintained, kept up, um, renovated, um, uh, repaired if they're damaged. Um, there's no prohibition against that, a continuing use of it. Um, and the same for uses that are already established in a TOD. Um, and, and that also includes if, if they have been vacated for a certain period of time, um, they can be reestablished as well. Um, uh, new, um, so, so, so these uses may be, um, May continue to live, for example, in a single family home. If you're in a TOD district, um, you could repair your house. Um, if it got damaged, you could repair it. Um, you, and then, then there are a few uh, provisions for expanding non-conforming uses and structures as well. Um, it, in many cases would require uh, getting a special use permit from the Board of Adjustment, um, but there is a, a process to uh, request that and evaluate uh, whether that's a, um, will be granted. Um, so the point here is that um, the prohibited uses and a lot of standards are really focused on new development, um, planning um, for the future for um, you know, encouraging that development to be more transit oriented rather than car oriented. Um, so we have um, Transit-oriented transit overlay district um, in Raleigh zoning code. Um, in order for it um, to be applied, um, it has to be um, in on the official zoning map. Um, and so that is the nature of this, this meeting um, and this process um, is to, um, the zoning map is changed through a rezoning request. Um, this is a public process. Uh, it's one that ends um, with city council holding a public meeting and making a final vote on whether to approve or deny that. Um, I will talk about the process in a moment, um, but I wanna talk a little bit about the actual area that the, the rezoning request is um, requesting to change the zoning map. Um, the, the best way to view that map is um, online. Uh, we have a page dedicated to this project, um, which, uh, can uh, find by searching um, the city's website, rawlingnc.gov or TOD mapping, or really opening a search engine and, and searching TOD mapping and Raleigh would, would also get you there. Um, and then about halfway down page, there is a link to this um, TOD proposal viewer. It is an interactive map. You can uh, zoom in, um, click on properties um, and search for a property. Um, if you're not sure if it's in or out of, of the area. Um, and, and we can help with any questions you have about that um, later in this meeting or at any point. Um, as you can see um, from, from this uh, image, the area is um, kind of irregular. So I wanna talk about how we got to this particular uh, district. Um, and the thinking that went into it. Um, 
in general, the, the goal of applying this TOD uh, along um, the southern, future southern BRT corridor, um, as well as you saw the western, future western BRT corridor, um, is to um, encourage transit oriented development um, within a walking distance of the BRT route. In this case, that is um, about a quarter mile of the route itself. Um, and then we're looking um, generally at areas that are already able to develop uh, with this type of development, uh, mixed use, more transit oriented, or is are recommended for that um, intensity of development in the future, or more likely to redevelop in that direction. Um, and so when uh, the city council approved the changes to the TOD um, and uh, authorized the city to start this uh, rezoning request, um, came up, uh, up with a handful of criteria um, that would, that would as we looked through the quarter mile area around the, the transit route, would um, put those properties in the request um, and have them listed here. So they include um, areas that can already develop with mixed use development. So the underlying zoning um, is a mixed use district or, or a heavy industrial, um, or there is future uh, land use guidance um, for uh, mixed use or medium or high, high scale residential. So the future land use map um, is a, a policy a document, part of the, the 2030 comprehensive plan that is uh, looking into the future, um, uh, knowing that the, the city is continuing to grow and uh, thinking where, how, how will that growth be um, materialize in Raleigh? What is the, what is an appropriate future land use um, for the city as a whole? Um, so every property has a designation on that. Path. And, and um, if one was one of the mixed use designations or a, a more, a more um, higher scale residential um, of a certain size was, was also included um, in this request. Um, and then areas uh, that are a certain size and along right along the BRT, so they have a frontage on a future bus rapid transit route also were included, um, as well as um, properties that already are uh, apartment, uh, more intensive residential apartment uh, development um, of a certain size. And then finally, um, city-owned properties, uh, not including parks and greenways, um, you know, if those develop in the future, city wants those to, to align with these goals, so they were included as well. Um, so this is the list. Um, if a property in the quarter mile area of the future BRT fell in one of these, um, it was included, um, except uh, if it, it fell under one of, the, one of the few categories that really makes it not suitable for the TOD. Um, and, and these um, are, this is the list of them. So cemeteries, properties that are owned by the state, um, schools or um, universities and colleges really have a more of a campus setting. It's a much different form. Um, a few cases there are properties that have a rail line owned by a railroad company, have a rail line, um, or areas that are really cut off um, from reasonable walkable access. Um, it doesn't, isn't likely for those areas to develop in a, in a, a transit supportive way. Um, and then areas that have a landmark or designation um, focused on preserving the built form in that particular area. So uh, neighborhood conservation overlay districts, historic, uh, local and national uh, registered districts and historic landmarks were also left out at this point. Um, and then finally, there are, there are a few zoning districts um, that uh, don't align super well for uh, the, the TOD. Um, conservation management is essentially open space. Uh, plan developments are uh, very unique to the particular site, so it's hard to generalize on them. And then downtown mixed use is applied to, to Raleigh's downtown core. I'm going to turn now and talk about the process, uh, what you can expect um, moving forward. Um, as I mentioned, though, this it has several uh, iterations of review. It ends up in front of city council. 
I mean, right now we are at the very beginning stages of it. So we're at what's called the first neighborhood meeting. Um, after this, after tonight, uh, the staff will put together a application, a formal application for the rezoning request um, and um, submit that for review. There'll be staff review and a second neighborhood meeting will be held, um, similar to, in format to this one, very likely. Um, I would expect that that is most likely to occur um, probably in March is the general timing that that looks like. And then next steps would be, it would be put on the agenda for a planning commission meeting. A planning commission is the appointed body that reviews um, rezoning requests and they make recommendations on planning related matters. Um, they'll hold a public meeting. Um, anyone could can go to, sign up to speak and participate in. Um, very likely that, that this request because of its size will be discussed at more than one, I would say, planning commission meeting. Um, but eventually the planning commission will make a recommendation to the city council uh, about whether to approve or deny the request um, or approve uh, with suggested changes um, is also a possibility. Um, and then the city council will also um, receive that request, that recommendation rather from the planning commission and they will schedule a public hearing. So that's another meeting, a public meeting um, where they'll review and, and consider the request and hear from the public. And then um, eventually uh, make a vote on whether to uh, approve or not um, the rezoning request. So as I said, um, sort of iterative, many opportunities for um, participation. Um, you are already participating in these um, if you are attending your na neighborhood meeting. Um, so um, other ways in the future are the second meeting, um, second neighborhood meeting. Um, there's an opportunity um, to leave comments and ask questions in the rezoning engagement portal. This is something that's it's open now. It is a way that the city um, answers questions and collects feedback on rezoning requests. Um, and I can talk more about how to access that um, and how, how, um, how we can use that. All of the comments that we receive in the rezoning engagement portal are uh, collected and packaged up and, and provided directly to planning commission. Um, so if you have thoughts uh, or questions that we don't get to tonight, um, I would strongly encourage you to, um, to use the rezoning engagement portal um, to communicate that. And then of course, um, other opportunities for participation are to participate in the planning commission meetings, to sign up to speak in those if, if you want, um, as well as uh, the city council public hearing as well as the public meeting. Um, so again, the engagement portal, um, this is sort of a step-by-step -step way to act, find, find your way to the rezoning engagement portal. Um, we can also put the direct link in the in the chat as well. Um, but you go to the, the city's website, you can search for TUD mapping. It's going to get you to the project page for this process. And then near the bottom, there is a link to the rezoning engagement portal. Um, right now, that's going to bring you to the, the portal we use for all of the rezoning cases. So there might be a number of um, number of them, but if you scroll to find one called TOD Mapping Southern BRT. Uh, that's that's one specific to this um, this request uh, uh, in areas along um, South Wilmington Street. Um, and so, if the last note about this, if if you are making uh, uh, leaving a comment that pertains to you know wanting wanting the boundary to change in some way, wanting your property to be added or removed, um, I would just encourage you to leave your name and property address and, and comments so we know um, we know uh, what what area it, the comment is referring to and can um, package that up and um, uh, summarize it well. Um, so a, a few last comments about how to stay in touch in the future. Um, there are a number of public meetings ahead of us in this process. 
Um, if you are here because you received a letter in the mail, there will be a mailed notice uh, at future steps as well, uh, as well as signs posted along the corridor with uh, the meeting date and uh, email or uh, rather a web address to, to find out phone number to find out more information. Um, and then if you haven't already on the product page, there is also a place to put in your email uh, and sign up for uh, project updates. So that would be another way to stay in the loop. Um, and then um, you can always reach out directly to staff if you have uh, a question um, or, or a comment. Um, I'll finish on our contact information if you want to put that down. Um, I think that is the end of kind of our summary presentation. Um, I guess here for a second, and then we will move uh, move on to questions. Um, and as I mentioned, I think we're going to start with the questions in the chat, um, and then we can move on to other live questions if folks have them. So, stop sharing your screen. Take down the presentation. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. Like thanks, Hannah. I'm, I'm looking um, through the chat. I don't see that anyone has typed in um, any questions there. Uh, feel free to do so. Um, I, I also think uh, we, we have a comment that says, I'm very excited to see this progress, a uh, comment from James. Um, I think it's also appropriate if you'd like to uh, raise your hand. We have a, a pretty small group uh, tonight, um, so I think if we, uh, if you don't want to type in a question or if you're having difficulty accessing the chat function, um, you can raise your hand and, and we'll unmute you. Uh, I do see a question here from uh, Becky Burmester. The question is, uh, so affordable housing at 30% to 60%. Um, and I think, uh, and, and Becky, correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, please. I think what she's referring to is the required um, affordable housing target and the density bonus of the TOD. Yeah, so I can, that is the intent of the question. I will share a little bit of information. If, if um, that is in reference to one piece of the overlay is a height bonus. Um, and there's, there's two of them. One is for, um, fully non-residential development, so locating jobs near the transit route, and then the other is for location of affordable units. Um, and so the, the details of that um, are that it's a 50% height bonus um, if 20% of those extra units um, that are built are affordable for incomes less than 60% AMI. Uh, and that's affordable for at least 30 years. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I see there's another question from Alex, um, and we'll get to you next, Alex, but there's also uh, a participant of the meeting who called in by phone. Um, and so uh, since you do not have access to the chat function um, caller, I am going to unmute you and um, you can ask us your questions directly. Um, so when I click uh, unmute, um, you should hear a dial tone to ask you to press, I think, one or two to unmute yourself. So I'm going to do that now. Um, and so I've asked you to uh, unmute. OK. Uh, I'm not seeing uh, that. That person has unmuted themselves. Uh, I'll click it again. Um, okay. So uh, we can try that again later if we want. Um, I'm going to go to a question in the chat from Alex Brown that says, What types of changes should be expected? for the residents of Renaissance Park near the edge of the purple overlay on the map. Yeah, I was gonna bring up the, 
the viewer. Um, I believe the large parcel that's closest to Renaissance Park already has a development plan in progress for affordable housing apartments. Um, I think that's the most like that's the most viable parcel right now. For I mean, it's it's vacant. Um, the shopping center there is also in the proposed rezoning. Um, so, you know, that also could see redevelopment in the future. But uh, so, yeah, that parcel on the north side of Chapin Oak, I believe, has a pending development plan for apartments that would be in uh, subsidized affordable housing. Um, so, if that is developed, it's likely to remain there for 20 to 25 years is a typical lifespan for a development like that, or potentially longer, depending on how it's maintained. Um, the shopping areas, if they redevelop, um, you know, this rezoning would prohibit them from being redeveloped as single story shopping centers, unless they redevelop, you know, complete the exact same building footprint and just kind of renovated the same building. But if they change the layout of the site, um, then they would have to build a story, a building with a minimum of two stories. And so that would likely point to, you know, potentially retail on a first floor with office or residential on upper floors. Uh, but, you know, in a lot of cases in this market, what we end up seeing is in a, a vertical mixed use uh, is not always desirable for a developer. Sometimes it, it can be a full office development or a full residential development with a a small retail component, maybe along the street. Um, so that those are kind of the likely, I think, future redevelopment options there. And so I think what's different between what you see in current zoning, which uh, I believe is commercial mixed use. Uh, but I'll double check that. I'm looking at it right now, John. It is the, the large shopping center is commercial mixed use with a three-story height limit. Um, most everything between Olympia and Chapin Oak that is not part of the uh, Renaissance Park PD is uh, commercial mixed use with a three-story height limit. So the difference between that zoning and that same zoning with the overlay applied is, is the prohibited uses. So those, you know, vehicle oriented uses, gas station, car wash, car dealership, those things would not be allowed to be developed. So it would be encouraging more of uh, either housing or employment focused uses and with a little bit more things, well, more density, certainly, than the current shopping center. Uh, and then the height could increase under certain situations. So, so Hannah mentioned the height bonus for affordable housing. So currently, you have a three-story maximum height with the overlay district. The maximum height could be increased to five stories if there is a certain number of affordable housing units included in that development. Uh, and then the other height bonus is that if it is a building that is used solely for commercial uses, so in most cases that's going to be an office, office building, although it could be an office with retail on the first floor, uh, that building could have a height of up to four stories, even if the, the underlying zoning says three stories. So I think that the main difference between the current zoning and what this overlay would do is going to be multi-story development that includes more housing and employment. Uh, and potentially a little bit taller. Great, thanks. A anything else you want to add to that, Hannah? No, I think that's a, that's that's a good summary. Okay, great. So we'll move on uh, to let me look in the chat to the next question. Um, we have a hand up from Mark Johnson. Mark, I'm going to um, ask to unmute you. You'll have to unmute yourself, um, but you can ask your question. Uh, you, you should be unmuted now, Mark. Yeah, I think I got it. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Okay, so um, just a, uh, two questions. So you just described one of the particular areas um, and, and that there were already potentially submitted plans in that area. Is it fairly simple to go to the website where the TOD information is and sort of zone, you know, zoom in to the specific part or neighborhood or region? of that map and find out if there's already plans to develop something in that particular region? Uh, I think the, the, 
the viewer may not be the best way of doing that. The way that I would recommend, and I, you know, my colleagues might have different methods that they use more, but what I would do if you're looking at a particular geographic area is um, you can go on the city and Wake County. We have a combined mapping platform called IMAPS. That's I-M-A-P-S. And so you can usually find that on a search engine if you search Raleigh IMAPS. Uh, and once you're in that mapping platform, it's interactive. It's kind of like Google Maps. You can pan around, zoom in, zoom out, search by address. Um, that there is a series of layers that you can turn on and off. And uh, in the, there is a set of layers called planning and development. And then within that set, there is a subset called Raleigh planning and development. And within that, there is one called development plans. And so if you turn that development plans layer on, you can see where there is active pending development plans uh, in Raleigh. And so, you know, I, and I suppose I could share my screen and you could see me doing this if you, if you like. I mean, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, but basically, once you have that layer turned on, then you can use the identify tool and click on that plan area and it will bring up a pop-up window that lists the plan number. Uh, and then the, then the next step from there would be to go to the city website, RaleighNC.gov. And there, the two most common types of plans that you're probably looking for are subdivision cases and site plan cases, which are also known as administrative site review. And so on the city website, there is a web page called subdivision cases that has all the active cases listed. Um, and then the, I can never remember if the other one is called site plan cases or site review cases. Uh, but it's, it, it's one of the other of those. Uh, there's a web page for those as well. And so the active case are listed there. And those, those pages with the subdivisions and the site plans, uh, the, the application is linked from each, it's a list of the cases. And so there's a link to the application. Uh, and so you can pull that up and it'll show you uh, the layout of what is being proposed there. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm going to, uh, Mark has indicated in the chat that he has two more questions. Uh, Mark, I'm going to unmute you again. You can unmute yourself and ask your next question. Appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for that explanation. Um, Bynum Walter sent a link. Uh, I, click, I clicked on it, um, read it briefly. One of the things that popped out to me was in existing uh, homes, vehicle parking may have a, no more than a maximum of two assigned spaces. And um, is, is that in areas of purple or is that in areas of gray that already exist that already have a home with parking spaces? So it sounds like that's referring to the TOD parking uh, rules, um, which are, um, no parking is required for residential units and a maximum of two units, uh, sorry, two spaces per unit um, can be provided. So, so that's, um, that's what, uh, those are, that's the parking rules for the TOD. So on the map, on the viewer map, that's the areas in purple. Purple, okay, okay. The gray oh. is a reference of roughly what a quarter mile it looks like. Okay, all right. Now that, that probably answers my third and final question. You had there uh, one of the slides you had said on um, duplex housing and asterisks maybe rebuild the damage. Of course, <laughs> my first thought was, whoa, they're building something near my house and my house gets damaged. That's not what you were talking about, right? I think you're probably talking about something different. No, yeah. So that's referring to um, uh, uh, single unit, two unit living as a prohibited use in the TOD. But existing single existing examples of those uses may continue to operate. Can be you can repair your house, uh, rebuild it, like for like. Um, that's the asterisk. But Got it. All right, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Um... I'm gonna lower Mark's hand. 
Are there any other questions? Let me look in the chat. I think I saw a question in the chat from Kay Aiden about whether or not the, how to request removal from the district. Um, oh. And so, I mean, the best way to do that is to go to the engagement portal. And that is linked from the DOD mapping webpage. It was also posted in the chat for this meeting. Uh, so that's a pretty quick link there. You want to go directly to it. And what we are asking is that if you do want to request that your property be removed, that when you go into the survey for the engagement portal, it's going to ask for your name. And then it's going to ask you, do you have questions about this? Do you have comments about this? Uh, and so just that you put in a single comment your name, your address, and that you want, you know, whether you want the parcel added or removed. And that way, sometimes if, if you put your name in one of those responses and a comment in the other response, it's hard to link those together when we export the results. But putting all that information in a single comment uh, makes it really easy for us to just have that in one place. And then what we'll do is once uh, we are done with these neighborhood meetings and we're ready to go to the planning commission, we will create a report with all those comments and we'll share that with the planning commission and they can just look at them one by one and say, does this make sense? Uh, and they have, they just have that all right there for that. So that's what we'd like for you to do. And then if you do have specific questions about your property, of course, you can put them uh, in that survey and we can respond directly in the engagement portal. If you put a question in there, we can reply in the survey and you, and you can also ask a follow-up question. It's kind of like social media. You can chat back and forth. Uh, or you can contact us directly, call us on the phone, we can talk through it with you as well. So, uh, but we do encourage you to use the engagement portal. There's a question. Uh, where in the chat, this is from uh, G. Schofield, where are the proposed uh, bus slash transit stations going to be, even if it's just a general area? It looks like that was also answered in the chat here by Bynum. Um, she posted a link to a... <clears throat> A BRT uh, presentation, um, and on the seventh page of that document, um, there are uh, a couple of different route alternatives. So if you're reviewing this document, um, the preferred alternative uh, that will actually is where the BRT will go. Um, I believe it's alternative five on this map. Um, there's a couple of different places you can you can find that. Um, so I hope, hope that is helpful. Happy to, if you're poking around and want to have, ask more questions about that, we can we can certainly talk about it. I don't know if this has already been shared in the chat, but I just I put the project page for the Southern ERT project uh, in general. Um, if folks have want to read more about that that project. Great. All right. Any other questions? We've had some people leave, so hopefully they got the information they were looking for. And I'll offer, uh, you know, we are city staff. You are paying for this time as taxpayers and residents of the city. We are going to be here for a good while longer, regardless of whether you're here or not. Uh, so, you know, if you have general questions about other things going on in the city, we are happy to help you find that information. And, and I'll add, um, if you've gotten the information that you need, um, we'll invite you uh, to leave as well. Um, we are, uh, we can go back through more information, um, but I think we've covered what we want to cover tonight. I see a hand up um, from G. Schofield. Uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself when you get a notification. Uh, thanks. Um, just wondering if we, if you have some time, um, 
my wife and I, we sit in on, on a, as many of these meetings as we can. Um, we've got a number of things in the mail about uh, Dick's Park, the Dick's Edge study, and we've been pretty engaged on, on that uh, front. And um, I'm just wondering if, if you have some time to just kind of, uh, can you kind of weave these projects together a little bit? And like, like how, how do they kind of, they obviously all have to kind of um, uh, coexist, if not like, you know, have direct uh, things to do with one another, right? So if you could just kind of talk a little bit about that, uh, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, um, I can start with that. So uh, Bynum, Hannah, and I are all part of the uh, Dick's Edge planning team. Um, we're also on uh, this TOD uh, rezoning and mapping team. Um, we are also on other uh, BRT-related planning projects throughout um, this area of the city. So I think the best place to kind of start is at the beginning um, with when uh, Hannah touched on it in, in 2016, uh, Wake County voters, uh, all of Wake County voted to approve uh, um, a half cent sales tax to fund bus rapid transit and other transit improvements in the city. Uh, and when that happened, um, city planners in our office and um, government, or excuse me, um, council officials uh, decided to start looking at how we grow around that transit investment. Um, and uh, all of the city started to plan on bringing this infrastructure into operation. Um, and our, our first route of active BRT will be along New Run Avenue, and it'll be in operation, hopefully by the beginning of 2024. So uh, we've come a long way, and that'll be our first route. Um, the next two routes are Western and Southern. So Western BRT will go from downtown along Western Boulevard into Cary, into downtown Cary. And then the Southern BRT route will exit uh, downtown Raleigh and go down Wilmington Street uh, into Garner. Uh, so the Western and Southern routes actually go into other cities, which makes this a regional transportation system. Um, so connecting our cities uh, to, or our city to uh, adjacent towns. And, um, to help guide and organize and make those decisions, the city has a comprehensive plan and it's called the 2030 comprehensive plan. Um, and it is used by, uh, staff and city council to inform, um, public decisions, inform decisions of how money is spent and inform decisions of uh, how and where development occurs. Uh, the comprehensive plan is used to inform legislative decisions. The city council is the local legislature and the legislative actions that they are most involved in are development laws, i.e. zoning and budgeting, how to spend tax dollars. Those are the, those are the two major legislative actions that they um, are involved in. And these types of plans and processes, uh, the Dick's Edge area study will be looking at um, the existing comprehensive plan guidance uh, for that area. Uh, and when we do area studies like that, uh, as you know, if you've been involved with uh, the study, you've probably been to several public meetings where we talk about land use and transportation and um, natural resources, uh, affordable housing uh, and development and, and the future of the community. And so we take that public input um, and use it to amend the city's comprehensive plan, which is then used by the city council to make decisions about local laws, about zoning and about budgeting. Um, this action and this meeting that we're doing right now is mapping of a new type of zoning that was the process of a different study that was conducted a few years ago, equitable development around transit. Um, and the results of that study was a recommendation to um, amend the TOD or transit overlay district and then map it around our new transit stations. Um, so as a result of that study, we are now implementing a recommendation of the study by mapping a new zoning tool, changing a law in those purple areas on the map. 
to encourage affordable housing, uh, incentivize affordable housing, unlike anything we've ever done in the city. The city spends money, local tax dollars, federal and state tax dollars on subsidizing affordable housing on projects where the city will buy property um, or have public private partnerships where we subsidize uh, development projects um, to produce affordable housing. What this project, how it is different in mapping this zoning is that it is incentivizing private development to create affordable housing without the city spending public tax dollars to do it. And it's, and, and it's achieving that by uh, incentivizing it with a, with a, a building height bonus. Uh, so we talked about how a three-story building, well, now you can build a five-story building if you're zoned for three stories, if a portion of those additional two stories is set aside as affordable housing. So that's going to incentivize um, the creation of those units because um, the builder or the developer can benefit from the additional portion of those two stories. And then the community has a benefit of subsidized affordable housing that doesn't cost tax there's really uh, any money the way that other types of projects do. I will also want to just kind of say why affordable housing in transit rich areas is, is so important um, and, and how it really helps to um, increase the cost of living and increase the expense of living in the city is transportation costs are very expensive. And so, um, if you live in a place where your only option is to drive a car, to, to run all your errands, to go and see your friends and family, to go to work, if, you're only, if your only choice is um, you have to drive a car, that means you have to own a car. Um, and uh, your family may need to own two cars. Um, and so that means you have two sets of car payments, you have insurance for both cars, uh, you're putting uh, regular maintenance into your cars, you're buying eight tires if you own two cars, uh, and you're buying gasoline. That's all very expensive. Um, transportation costs can account to up to a third of uh, a household's annual expenses. And so if you live in a place where um, you can take some of those trips uh, in your car and replace them with walking to a nearby store um, for shopping or recreation or uh, running errands, um, or if you can ride a bus, uh, to, to do some of those things, or if you can get to a place uh, on a bicycle, um, because uh, there's infrastructure that supports that, that means you spend less time in your car, uh, you spend less money on maintaining your car, you burn less fossil fuels driving your car, and uh, you may not need to own two cars. So that, that takes cost down. Um, so anyone living in that situation is spending less money on transportation. If we also have affordable housing that is subsidized to a rate that um, is affordable to people with middle and low incomes, um, they're paying less in rent and they're paying less in transportation. Uh, it, it means that living in these places is less expensive. Uh, so there's a great um, combining uh, affordable housing and, and um, less expensive transportation options really helps to move the needle and making living in the city less expensive. So that was a lot um, in a lot of different directions. I hope that was helpful. Bynum, I see you um, waving. Yeah. I, yeah, I just was gonna chime in and say, I thought that was all great, but I, I think, um, and I can't remember who asked the question. I, was, I think it was maybe- Schofield. Mr. Schofield. Um, you know, I think what, what I see is that the, um, private investment south of downtown coming in downtown south, which there's another question about that in the chat, the public investment in Dorothea Dix Park and the public investment in the BRT corridor, the Southern and the Western one, um, we recognize that that is putting a lot of development pressure on this part of the city. And I think that's largely what prompted us to initiate the, that Dix Edge area study. Um, so I think, you know, to your point, yes, these things all do mesh together, fit together and impact each other. And that's part of why uh, we set out just on the, on the path of that Digs Edge area study, just recognizing that there's a lot happening in this part of the city and that the, um, 
coordination among the different um, parties. So you have uh, the Parks Department is largely leading the Berthia Dix Park, the um, BRT implementation. Raleigh plays a very large role in that. We're the, what the, we're technically the project sponsor, but there's uh, also collaboration with Garner, Carey, um, Go Triangle, uh, as well as the private investment that will come from downtown South. You know, that's not a city initiated project. That's a, a privately initiated project. And so just recognizing there are a lot of players and that um, thinking holistically about all those pieces coming together and how they work together uh, is something that the city has identified as an important uh, point for collaboration and communication. So, didn't mean to derail, but wanted to offer kind of a different lens. I also have a, a lens now on John that. wants to pile <laughs> on. All, all, all I want to say is those are um, super important, you know, city and community goals that I think we're exploring there, but just in a very physical sense, I think a big part of the BRT planning is going to be that a person getting off of these bus services is going to have a safe and comfortable and convenient way to walk to Dix Park uh, and not have to battle vehicles to get there. And I think the Dix Edge plan did a lot of work to say, how are pedestrians going to get both from the north side and the east side to Dix Park and the BRT planning, the corridor plans, Southern Gateway plan, the, the Western uh, Boulevard corridor plan are doing a lot of the same work. And I think, a bit, you know, that's not just a benefit in that immediate area, but it is also a huge benefit for folks who might live at either end or in the middle of these corridors, if they feel like it's just as easy for them to jump on the bus, get up to the park, that that, that can be just as much their park as the person who lives across the street. So I think, you know, the BRT has a real power to equalize that access or at least bring some similarity to that access. Hannah, do you want to have the last word? <laughs> We've all no, chimed no, in. covered it. <laughs> it was um, a question. Oh, go ahead. No, you. Well, there was a question in the chat about will the future downtown South development be included in BRT TOD plans. So um, the um, Southern corridor that runs down Wilmington Street that's proposed to run down Wilmington Street passes along the east side of the downtown South uh, property assembly. And there is a, a station anticipated roughly in the Wilmington Street, Fable Street intersection area um, that would likely support uh, or provide service to the downtown South development. And, um, you know, that station location has been kind of roughly out there. That alignment um, has been an option for a long time. And I think that largely drove, um, may have been a factor in the um, developer interest in, the, in that land, that they, they were likely to have uh, BRT service either on the east side via Wilmington Street or on the west side on Saunders Street. You know, we were kind of back and forth for a while about wh where the alignment would land, but where the preferred alternative um, that's uh, moving forward in design is that Wilmington Street corridor. And then I think uh, Mr. Schofield still has his hand up. I don't know if you want to ask him to unmute for that lap. If you have another question. Yeah, or uh, you can put, put your hand down if you'd like, um, or I can ask you to unmute. Uh, he says he's all set, so I will lower your hand <clears throat> all right um feel free to type your questions in the chat or raise your hand and we'll unmute you um just reiterate what john said if there are other uh, questions that you have uh, not directly related to the rezoning um we can try to help answer those questions for you um, if we can't, we um, can't do it tonight. We can get you in touch with someone who can uh, tomorrow or um, or next week. So um, we're we're here to be helpful. So let us know how we can do that.
I don't know that. So there's that question was, what are the names of the different corridors? Uh, so right now they are just, well, the, the Western and Southern are just going by those cardinal directions, Western and Southern, which, you know, for Western Boulevard is also conveniently the name of the street. So that's very helpful. It's very direct for folks who might not be as familiar with the area. That is an easy connection to make. Uh, New Bern, named for the street, New Bern Avenue, the one running east from downtown. Uh, well, if we're calling, uh, I guess in the transit plan, what's well, sometimes referred to as the Eastern Quarter, but New, New Bern is what we're calling it for the purpose of planning, the station area planning process. And I think that naming is likely to remain. I think there is a lot of affinity for New Bern uh, in, in that area. And then Southern, again, we're, we're calling Southern just after the direction. Um, I don't know if Go Raleigh has plans to entertain you know, a community-based process to, to have different names. Uh, I, I have heard from Go Raleigh staff that they are not entertaining uh, sponsorships for, the, for the, the routes or the stations at this time. That could be something considered in the future uh, to have you know, a private company or a nonprofit or even a private individual uh, make some sort of contribution and have a naming right. Uh, but right now that is not, not something that they are taking offers on. Um, and I think the reasoning for that is that they really wanna focus on getting the, the, the engineering complete and getting these services running and not to have any complications uh, you know, as, as valuable and you know, community outreach uh, benefit as that might be, that really the, the key thing is getting this service available to riders as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that too. I think um, an important part of the BRT is, uh, and, and and I know that there's a communications team working on this internally and with uh, Go Triangle, uh, but the branding of the BRT, um, and uh, I, I think really so that folks using the service. Um, when they're walking down the sidewalk to the bus or bus stop that they can differentiate the BRT buses from the other Go Raleigh buses or uh, Go Carry buses or um, Go Triangle buses. So they will, uh, you will be able to differentiate the bus itself from the others with, um, it'll, uh, I'm not sure if we have a name uh, for it, like John was saying, but uh, there will be different branding and it will be uh, distinguishable from those other, the rest of the vehicle fleet. So we have Nathan Spencer in the chat said, Go Plus is the current branding plan. Um, thank you, Nathan. All right, got a question in the chat from Kay Din. It says, to clarify, how many BRT stops are planned on the Southern Corridor between downtown and Renaissance Park area? So it looks like there's a stop at Shaw, that uh, stop at, um, Wilmington and Fayetteville that we talked about previously. There's another one probably on Wilmington right before it crosses Saunders south of 440 and then the stop at Renaissance Park. So that's uh, one, two, I think three stops. Yep. And then there will be a stop uh, at Garner. Right. Uh, in, in Garner on um... Mm -hmm. Garner Station Boulevard, I believe. Yeah. In that, that area. Uh, 
there's a question here that says, is there more than one developer in the southern and western areas? Do you know who the developers are? I hear the name Kane a lot. Do the developers get tax incentives or reduction in their taxes? I can jump in on that. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to development, that is really driven by private property owners. And there are dozens, if not hundreds of private property owners represented between the Western and Southern quarters on BRT. So, uh, you know, that it's difficult. That question, I don't think has really a simple answer. It's really each property owner at the point where they feel like the economic value of their property is benefited by using it in a different way than it's currently being used. Um, they make a decision. And you know, when you, the term developer, I think has a lot of different meanings, right? So a property owner to a certain extent is a developer when they choose to change the way they use their property. But that property owner might may also uh, secure the services of an engineering firm, a contractor, uh, various other professionals and, and folks who assist them with that process. Those people are also a lot of times lumped into the term developer. Sometimes attorneys are involved, uh, you know, if there are easements that need to be acquired, if there's a rezoning process, uh, sometimes attorneys are considered developers in that sense. So, you know, that's a, that's a complex question. Um, that, so who the developers are, honestly, it can be anyone who has an interest in making use of the zoning that applies to their property to be a developer. Um, the name Kane, uh, yes, there is a developer in Raleigh that, that well, the company's called Kane Realty. I think they're probably most well known for the North Hills shopping mall, the redevelopment of that, um, and have done other projects in downtown. Um, they did pursue the rezoning of the downtown South site, which is near the intersection of South Saunders and uh, I-40. That was approved uh, a little over a year ago. And so that company does have an interest, a large you know, property interest in this area. And it's likely that they do have a pending development plan on that property currently. Uh, so they, yes, are a developer along this BRT, along the Southern BRT route. Um, and then do folks get tax incentives? So part of the downtown South conversation and ensuing conversations was about a concept called a tax increment grant. And I think that may be what you're referring to. Uh, so a tax increment grant is a process by which during a development uh, plan, a developer would offer to provide some type of public benefit, uh, an infrastructure improvement, some public amenity, and that they would construct that as part of their development. And then they would have an agreement with the city where a portion of their property tax proceeds for some period of time after they complete their development, a portion of that property tax is returned to the developer to basically pay for those infrastructure improvements. That's a very rough way of describing what a tax increment grant does. And so, um, in a lot of cases, that money that the developer spent on that public improvement is money that the city probably would have spent or would not have been spent at all. That public improvement would just not have been done. And so I think there are differing views about the value and the who, who perceives the benefits of tax increment grants, uh, but the city council has, has approved of their use, has approved of a legal framework by which developers can pursue them and receive approval from the city council. Uh, and that is something that now is, is available, not just you know, to developers along these bus rapid transit routes, but really to any developer in Raleigh. Uh, and so you know, that is in a sense, a tax incentive. I think it's important to note that there is a public benefit or improvement to public facilities that occurs because of that. <clears throat> uh, there's another question in the chat. Um, 
Will the new busway street section with dedicated bus lanes be installed on all BRT corridors? Uh, how is it decided what area gets dedicated lanes? Uh, and thank you for your answers. Let's see. The busway street section is proposed for the bus rapid transit corridors. And so what that does is it, it that is something that it goes into the city's street plan map. The street plan map is a policy map in the city's comprehensive plan. And what that the, the purpose of a street plan map is to say uh, how, you know, there's two basically two things a street plan map does. Where should there be new streets that don't exist today? And then where there are existing streets, what what should be the improvements to the streetscape and the lanes of that street? And so the bus rapid transit corridors uh, are in the process of having this busway street applied, which would communicate that the intended improvement to those streets includes a dedicated lane for bus service, for bus rapid transit. And it also includes um, you know, sidewalks, curb and gutter, um, so it, it, it has the other streetscape improvements as well, but one of the key things of that busway street, what gives it the name of the busway street, is that it has a dedicated lane for buses. And so for the most part, you know, for New Bern, for Southern, the Southern Quarter, for the Western Boulevard Quarter, um, the way that those lanes will actually be constructed is through these bus rapid transit quarter improvement projects. So those are, you know, uh, being led by the city, the city's transit agency, Go Rally. Uh, there will be federal funding. There's, there's been federal funding secured at least for the New Bern quarter. And there, the city is also seeking grants for the other quarters. That's probably where a portion of the, the money for that is going to come from, as well as a dedicated sales tax for bus rapid transit. Uh, but that is going to be city led to, to install those dedicated bus lanes or to convert existing lanes into those dedicated bus lanes and then do the streetscape improvements that produce that final form of the busway street. Uh, and, but then there are other streets in Raleigh that can also be, have that busway street type applied. So large corridors where we have high frequency transit service, we have a high volume of transit ridership. Um, those can also have the busway street applied and go Raleigh and the city's transportation department are interested in that idea as well. And the reasoning for that uh, in addition, you know, this is similar reasoning for the bus rapid transit quarters, although, like I said, the city will be doing a lot of that work, is that when you apply a street on the street plan map, and it says here are the improvements that sh should be done on this street, that requirement not only applies to city projects, it also applies to private development. So uh, on streets that don't have BRT projects, but do have a busway street applied, if there is a private development that has frontage on that street, then that private development will be required to provide any additional right of way that is needed to accommodate those additional bus lanes and the streetscape area. Uh, and so that having those streets in the street plan really helps um, the city as, as development occurs for that area where the development is occurring to be prepared for the, the long-term goal of that street instead of what we don't want to happen is as development occurs, people are making improvements in areas that will become a street in the future. And then the city has to come and buy that improvement and pay, you know, pay that property owner to remove something that they had fairly recently constructed. We don't want to interfere or disturb someone's development in that way. We want them to have a development that is sustainable that they can keep for the long-term. Uh, and so the decision, how is it decided is, you know, the bus rapid transit quarters was, we, we know we're going to be installing those additional lanes. Uh, the decision of whether they go on the high frequency transit routes, um, that is going to be, you know, would be through a public process that in, would be a staff proposal to be authorized by city council and then have public review. Really great questions, everyone.
So I see Nathan um, commenting in the chat. Um, Nathan, you serve on the RTA advisory group, is that right? Do we have to ask him to unmute? Yeah, can we, or he might answer in the chat. That uh, uh, it's easier to answer on, on yeah. mute uh, or voice. Uh, yes, yeah. I, I am the vice chair of the uh, the Raleigh Transit Authority. Um, yeah, and uh, we, John John has presented in front of us many a time. So yeah, good to see yeah, um, we all know but, who you are. But I thought there might be some folks in the meeting. You know, this is, oh, I apologize. You're known yes. to staff, but um, James and Sally and Kay might not know you. So I just want yeah. them to understand sort of where you were coming from. So let me put some color to that then. Um, uh, the Raleigh Transit Authority oversees the uh, planning process and the choices that get made by Go Raleigh in terms of regular bus routes, but also the planning of the bus rapid transit. So with regards to the Southern Corridor, there was a choice between South Wilmington or South Saunders the choice was made to do South Wilmington because there was an ability to do more with it versus um, a very, very busy South Saunders that um, would impact small businesses quite a bit. So we, uh, we made the choice to do uh, the, the road less traveled, if you will. Okay, thanks for that. Looks like we have a new. I know. I saw that. Yeah. So welcome, Lisa H. Um, so we just had uh, a new person join. Lisa, uh, please feel free to um, put your name or questions that you have in the chat. Um, I'll also ask. I. I I think I remember your name from last night's meeting. So let me know if you were at last night's meeting um, and if you would like um, to ask any follow-up questions from them um, or you can indicate to us if you'd like. Uh... Okay, so Lisa says no questions. Um, yes, she was at last night's meeting. Okay, well, thanks thanks for coming back, Lisa. Um, We'll, we'll be here until eight to answer uh, any other questions. I see a question from Lisa. When do the recordings and questions get posted? Uh, so we are, yeah, we've recorded these meetings. And so we have to work with our IT department here at the city to get those onto first the city's YouTube channel and then we get to link them from the project webpage. So that's something that uh, does take a couple of days. So we'll probably put that request in tomorrow or Monday. And I think we can probably get those up uh, by about Wednesday of next week. Um, the chat feed, we don't typically post that. I guess it is public record. Um, <clears throat> I suppose if we have a request, which I, I, I guess I'm perceiving that that is a request to post the chat, um, then we can put that on the project webpage. Um, and then, yeah, the, the chat in the Q&A, I think that was the way these meetings are structured, the, the way the platform works, that's all one, the same stream of chat. So I don't, the week yet we can post that file. Um, but I, in terms of questions and answers, uh, I do want to say that we, we are trying to encourage folks to 
use the engagement portal for questions, um, that is a little bit more formal, it's a little more structured. Uh, and so, and we have the ability to, to respond more consistently in the engagement portal. So we do wanna encourage people to use that. And, and in the engagement portal contents do get reported to the planning commission and the city council later in the process. So uh, we do that, we think that is a, a superior way of documenting those interactions. So uh, if you do have, you know, if you or your neighbors have follow-up questions, uh, you watch the video, other people watch the video and they want to ask those questions, that engagement portal is gonna stay up probably at least for another good month, a little more, probably more than a month. Um, until we're ready to go to planning commission. So we, we want to encourage you to consolidate those interactions into that space. Uh, another direct question here, um, and John, you may have covered this, but just to answer directly, uh, Lisa said, I can't recall how or when engagement portal info gets posted. Um, what, that'll be included with the report we send to the planning commission and the city council. Excuse me. Um, we will keep the same engagement portal surveys open for the second round of neighborhood meetings, which will be after we submit the rezoning application. And then we'll, we'll export all of that information into a combined report. Well, one report for each of the corridors, and that will go to the planning commission. And so that, that's when it really becomes you know, published. It, it, it's included in the planning commission agenda, and then it will be publicly available uh, through the city website, through our uh, boarding commission agenda platform, which is called Board Docs, um, you know, for, forever, you know, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, and so those, you know, like I said, when, you, you probably won't be able to ready to go to planning commission until March. Uh, and then, so, you know, I would say you, you can check the planning commission webpage around March, mid-March probably, see if that, uh, this is showing up there or, well, You'll see on the the project webpage whether it's scheduled to go to the planning commission, and then from the planning commission webpage, you can access the agenda, uh, and that's where the these reports will be pu published. I would I would just add, John, um, the engagement portal. A lot of the comments that people make, you can see right now they're there. That's true already. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is that on the project page you can sign up for updates. So um, that's a way you know you'll get an email. Um, for example, when this goes to Planning Commission for review um, and other events associated with this project. So if you wanna keep up with what's happening, um, that might be um, of interest to you. Thanks for coming by, Lisa. Good night, James. Thank you.